Hello, my name is Greg Massey, and this is episode 22 of The Color of Air, a podcast about the musical journey. So welcome back after a couple weeks. How's everybody doing? Doing good, I hope. Um, Let's get the plugs out of the way. You can find us on the web at www.thecolorofair.com. Actually, no, I'm sorry. It's www.colorofair.com. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash podcast. You can find us on Twitter at The Color of Air. And uh, you can email us with any questions, comments at colorofairpodcast at gmail.com. And um, one other thing I want to talk about that's, you know, important to the podcast is that um, I'm not sure how you listen to us, if you get it through the website or through iTunes. If you do get our podcast through iTunes or through Stitcher, it's very important that you subscribe, rate, and review us on those services because that actually will, you know, hopefully in the long run help us out a little bit. Um, So, yeah. If that's the way you get this podcast, please go and do that, as we would appreciate it very, very much. Um, we got a pretty cool episode for you this week. Uh, I've been sitting on it for a couple weeks, just because things have been so crazy around here. But um, my guest on the podcast today is going to be Josh Strawn, who is the guitarist and singer of the band Vora, as well um as one of the main members of the group Azar Swan. And, um, you know, it, it, it took a few months. Um, he was definitely one of the people who, when I first started the podcast, he was on the list of people I wanted to get on here. So it took a little while to, you know, get schedules and everything else, uh, coordinated. Um, also it took me figuring out how to record phone calls as opposed to just Skype conversations. And, um, and I was really happy to finally have him on. Uh, he's an interesting guy, um, you know, and it, it was great to talk to him. And um, I hope you all enjoyed the music that I present of his, as well as, you know, enjoy my conversation with him. But before we get to that, um, <clears throat> a couple of pieces of business. So I did mention on the last podcast that I was going to be doing the RPM Challenge for February. And here we are. It is Thursday February 26th, and uh, as a status update, I think I'm probably not going to finish the challenge, and not for any lack of trying or for having material, quite the contrary. Um, Over this last month, I have been collaborating with a friend. Um, I'm kind of keeping it under wraps until the actual thing is done, but... um, you know, I collaborated with someone who provided me with lyrics, and um, it's been, I have to admit, it's been a really interesting experience, which, you know, is doing everything that I hoped it would, which is to kind of point out for me, as a uh, music writer, where my pitfalls lie, you know, what's, you know, figuring out what's distracting me, what's you know, keeping me from being focused on finishing things. Because I think I mentioned in the last podcast, it's not, the RPM challenge is not specifically for creating an amazing album in the month of February. It's about creating an album in the month of February. Because if you can create an album in the month of February, you will have, you know, committed to something and finished it, which goes a long way towards figuring out, you know, what are your stumbling blocks as a writer from, you know, finishing things. Um, And it gives you this kind of very short amount of time to figure that out and overcome them. And while I can't say I've overcome all the difficulties I have in getting things done, it did kind of teach me a few things. Um, One thing that was interesting to me was um, I was working on a song which was pretty much an instrumental and you know it was just only going to have one part just one guitar part and um 
I was sitting here recording it at home. I had experimented with some new tunings, and this thing just kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, that, that was kind of one of the joyous things about this thing is it really kind of let my guard down to kind of just be open to new ideas, and and this was one of them. And um, I sat here agonizing over recording the thing, and I mean, we're talking like a few hours and it's just like this short four minute thing. And, um, you know, I was trying to get a live take of it. So I was trying to get it all in one take. And, um, what I noticed was, you know, I, I started to, to develop like serious, um, you know, I think we kind of call it in music terms, a red light anxiety, which is that, you know, everything is great and you can perform really well, but as soon as the recording engineer hits the red light, the record button, things just fall apart. And, you know, and it it took a lot out of me to, and I'm sorry, this gets a little philosophical, but it really uh, forced me to confront, you know, what my brain does as soon as I hit that record button. What you know, what is stopping me from performing at my utmost abilities as soon as the record button is hit? Because, you know, just sitting around the house, I was playing through this thing like three, four, five times before I even tried to record it, um, you know, and it just sounded very good. It sounded natural. And, you know, as soon as I hit record, everything froze. And, you know, and I was starting to pay attention to little things like, oh, I hit this thing wrong and I did this wrong and I missed this uh, fill or this... Um, you know, transition, I didn't do this long enough. And I start getting into my own head about these things while I'm playing it. And that just makes the take just, it just ruins the take. And um, so in that regard, you know, the RPM was a success because it kind of showed an aspect of my, you know, how I approach recording from a mental standpoint and, you know, then forces me to, figure out a way around it. And so my method was to, instead of creating this very confined recording setup, which is what I'm used to, which is, you know, I sit with the acoustic guitar and a mic right in front of it and positioning it right. Instead of doing it that way, I decided instead to create a kind of open setup in my basement. So I used the H4N that I used to record podcasts and things. And I set it up so that it had, it was in four channel mode. So you had the built-in microphones and the, and I had two um, AKG C414s, which um, my singer Shannon and her boyfriend Mike were so super kind to let me borrow uh, for the time being. And I just created this open recording environment. So the placement of the mic wasn't as important as to, you know, what frequencies am I getting out of the guitar? You know, I didn't have to nitpick that thing. I wasn't going through a preamp. I didn't have to deal with all the that stuff. I just set the mics up and pretended as if I was recording a live performance. And um, lit some incense. And, um you know, and just hope for the best. And sure enough, after a few takes, I got a pretty natural sounding performance of this tune. Um, you know, it's not 100% perfect. I'm sure there's some flaws I could definitely perfect. Um, but for the purpose of my recording, I was pretty impressed with it. So, um, so yeah, so that, you know, that's my, been my impression of RPM so far is that it really helped me kind of get outside of my head a little bit. And, um, but, you know, uh, truth be told, you know, as, as, as it wore on, it's like, you know, I have, I think I have about five songs that I wrote for it. And um, there's, some of them are short, kind of instrumental things. And then there's this one longer piece, which is, you know, kind of been, I've been obsessing over. Um, and, um, it, and it just occurred to me this week that, you know, I'm just not going to be able to do these recordings enough justice to have them done in the next three days. <laughs> because, you know, RPM requires that, you know, you have a mixed, you have the mastered, and you have album cover. And um, I have neither of those things because I still have a bunch of stuff to record on them. And, uh, 
you know, due to the weather conditions, I wasn't able to get some um, musicians to come in and do some parts that I think would they would be better suited for. So, um, so yeah, so I did not complete the RPM challenge, but I do have this other project, which is this these songs um, in the works, and you know. I think right now, I mean, my main focus writing-wise is going to be this next Ballisite album. I really want to finish it um, because it's been too long and the music means so much to me and I want to get this out there. And then after that, I've got this whole other idea and um, it just it, it makes me feel very excited about music because it gives me options. It gives me things to do and to really you know, um, be prolific and creative and work without other people and get out there and, and do stuff. And, um, so I'm very excited about it. So that's my summary of the RPM challenge. And I hope you enjoyed that. Um, definitely going to be doing it next year. Um, and hopefully I will complete it. And, um, yeah, so that's, pretty much what's been going on here other than shoveling tons of snow um but uh yeah so uh the second piece of business is the topic of the week so um i a couple weeks ago i put out the topic of the week which was concept albums and i kind of talked about a few concept albums and um you know uh like the topic of the week the previous week i only got one response but again, that's totally cool. As long as I get at least one response, I feel like, you know, the topic of the week is pretty much a success. Uh, this is a long response, and since it was the only one, I feel like I can actually respond to it. And um, uh, this one came from Mark Sorrentino. Um, and he goes, hey, Greg, great topic of the week. Let me preface by saying that I focus far more on musical tone than I do on lyrics. I'm glad you mentioned Dream Theater because that's the first thing I think of when I hear concept album. I share your sentiments to a degree, but where I part is that I feel like as a band, they would sound better if they, if all they did was noodle their crazy instrumentals. I never cared for their vocal style and I can't stand rock ballads. So there's less than half that band's body of work that I can really enjoy concept or no concept. I don't get a whole lot of feeling from their music except that I like the mentally stimulating complex instrumentals. Uh, that's the first part of his email. And, um, you know, I, I, that is actually a really good point, Mark. Um, and I think this is kind of a dividing point with a band like Dream Theater. Um, and that's, you know, I think there are people who, you know, dislike the vocal style, and I can completely see that. I mean, uh, Dream Theater's vocalist, James Liberi, is really not one of my favorite vocalists. I I will be completely 100% honest with you. I mean, excuse me. Um I mean, he's a he's he's talented. I mean, he's got a range. But I think when it comes to vocalists, especially in this uh, you know, in the prog metal, prog rock kind of realm, you know, some of them kind of just there tends to be a lot of people who kind of focus on the very thin kind of voice, um, which I think is what James Labrie has. And, um, you know, if we're going to get into a discussion of dream theater vocals, you know, I will definitely be on the side of saying there are some definite, you know, stinger kind of vocal performances in their career. Um, I know it always kind of frustrates me, um, I love the album Awake. I think it's it's a really great album song-wise. But, you know, there are some times when he tries to sound tough and it just doesn't work. You know, it's it's one of those things, you know, when a death metal singer tries to sound... Uh, actually, no, let me, let me rephrase it. When a non-death metal singer tries to sound like a gruff, you know, death metal or hardcore kind of aggro style vocal, you know, nine times out of ten it sounds like shit. And, um, and, you know, I'm not a huge fan of James Labrie's vocals in the, in those regards, but I do think he has his, his moments. Yeah, excuse me. I don't know why I'm yawning while I do this. I'm very awake right now. But, um, 
you know, uh, I, I can say uh, Wait for Sleep off the uh, Images and Words album is, I think, is one of uh, his finest vocal performances. Um, you know, it's just got um, a delicate sense to it, which I think suits his voice perfectly. Um, so I can definitely agree with Mark's point there. I, th I think if you're into a band like Dream Theater, I think that you are going to fall into two camps where you either like the crazy stuff or you like their songwriting stuff. Um, obviously, me and Mark, I, I think, are on uh, different sides of that argument. But, um, you know, it, it's good to, to explain the second point because, you know, like I said, this this whole discussion, any discussion I bring up in the topic of the week is really just um, – subjective you know i'll give you my perspective but this is why i want to interact and <clears throat> you know have you email us because uh you know i want to hear other points of view you know um and kind of talk about it and so that's very cool but this uh this is a pretty long email so let me get on with it um and he he continues i'm glad you mentioned bjork and did i mention bjork i can't remember if i did or not but he says uh i'm glad you mentioned bjork because I was going to mention her if you didn't. Volnacura, the new one, is a great concept album and really tells a compelling story both in words and in music, which is the part I want to focus on. To me, this is where a band like Dream Theater falls short because tonally they're just progressive metal without a whole lot of character. He says, pardon me for being harsh. Um... I feel like a good concept album, since music is the medium, should tell much of the story with the music. With something like a Dream Theater concept album, the story is just kind of out of context, because you're sort of just listening to progressive metal, and the lyrics happen to tell the, tell a story. The delivery is not convincing. Bjork's music, for the most part, I think is uniquely rich in character, and in fact, most of her work has actually been in the form of concept albums, and done really well at that. In terms of musical tone, I think Bjork really hit a vein with the Medulla, an album about ancestors, which I felt uh, was almost humbling to listen to. And I think Volnacura is her most profound and focused album, musically speaking, since. Um, let me interject here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll be honest and say I'm not as well-versed with Bjork's output as um, other people are. Um Oh, I think because I mentioned um, the app on the on the, on the last uh, on the topic of the week, and uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I I think it's foolish for anyone to kind of talk shit about Bjork because I think in terms of you know uh, kind of important figures in music, whether or not you agree that her music is brilliant, um, I I don't think you can argue that she's been someone who's really made. Um, a, a pretty interesting, um, you know, contribution to music over the last 20, 20 years or whatever. And, uh, and, and I think, um, you know, so I think that he makes a good point and I agree with him that, uh, with concept albums, the music and the lyrics kind of have to gel. Um, I think that was one point I was trying to get through in my, la in my con in what I was talking about, because I felt that there were some where, okay, the concept was kind of cool, but then you kind of just don't really address it in the lyrics or it, like he's saying, it, it should kind of fit in a little bit with the music. So, another, <laughs> yeah, oh, geez, this is weird. Anyway, um, but he continues. Another example that illustrates the emphasis on musical storytelling is Sigur Rós with the album... Uh, he just put the parentheses, which I'm guessing um, is because the album doesn't have a song title or an album title. Again, not as experienced as Sigur Rós, so please don't um, get mad at me for butchering whatever their album title is, um, which doesn't even have really... And he says, sorry, the Sigur Rós with the album blank, which doesn't even have real words. The lyrics are in a made-up language, yet the album really seems to tell a compelling story whatever way you wish to interpret it. Musically, it flows from one song to the next, and as a whole, from start to finish, with a very clear shift in tone in the middle. It's one of those albums that I think is seriously best appreciated in totality. And that's cool. That's um, that's actually a good recommendation, Mark. Um, uh, I, I actually really like Sigaros, um, the bits that I have heard. And, um, you know, I think I've talked on this podcast about how 
um, a lot of what I've been doing the last five years and six years, seven years, whatever, has really been trying to explore music. And um, Sigur Rós is one of those bands that I do, uh, you know, I have wanted to explore more. Um, I know there are some, I don't know their song names by heart, but I saw a performance of one of the songs, uh, and it was a live recording um, of them in the studio. I believe it was Abbey Road Studios, too. And um, with, you know, kind of a small orchestra and choir and everything like that. And it it moved me a lot. I mean, I, I was dumbfounded. And... Um, how good it was and i'm sure you're screaming at your headphones now being like that's this song you idiot um but uh you know i i you know they're one of those bands that i just don't know well enough yet but what i have heard really kind of moves me and uh <laughs> in a kind of a funny uh side note um you uh, people who may have followed me on facebook know that i have a penchant for really um, you know, cheesy TV shows. Um, well, I don't think they're cheesy, but I think other people do. And, uh, one of those is, uh, you know, I was really a big fan of the show, The Vampire Diaries. And I'm, you know, I, I can almost hear the collective groan of, of you faithful listeners, but please don't unsubscribe because I like a show that might be silly. But, um, there is a really, you know, there's this, you know, I, I, I talk about this uh, with my wife because, you know, she used to, we used to watch it together. And, um, you know, uh, the show is filled with a lot of these kind of very um, kind of stereotypical uh, emo-ish ballady kind of songs, you know, like for uh, teen angst kind of uh, crap, which I think the show kind of mainly uh, is is focused on um, in terms of a, an audience. And... Um, and you know, and, and I always joke around that I, I just need to write one of these cheesy emo love songs, and you know, get myself played on a Vampire Diaries episode or pretty much any show on the CW. Let's be honest, and I'll uh, you know make a nice little paycheck for myself. And uh, whether or not that's true or not, I don't know. I don't know what the royalties are for getting played on the Vampire Diaries. But uh, in the season finale of one of the seasons, I think it was season three. Um, uh, one of the characters is is drowning, and at the same moment, uh, the, the song plays. And I remember being very blown away because I was like, I actually really like this song. And for a show that, you know, whenever a, a music cue happens, I usually vomit because it's usually some kind of really kind of piece of crap, like I said, emo, ballady, teen angsty shit. Um, this song really, really blew me away, and I was like, what is that? And it was Sigur so, uh, uh, so that, that's kind of cool, you know, um, you know, and it gives me, and based on what Mark's saying, and, you know, gives me more incentive really to investigate them more. Uh, but again, he's got a little more in his email and he says, uh, but of course I have to mention Kodot here as well, because as far as tone goes, I have yet to hear anything more captivating. Even though the only one that I know for sure was a concept album was Hubardo, every Kodot album really has an incredibly focused work of art, even with such a huge reign in tonality, like with Dazzling and Anemone. Uh, musically, each Kodot album, I think, tells a story from start to finish, even if the interpretation may differ between individuals. That doesn't really make them concept albums, but I do think of them as holes rather than thinking of a couple of songs I like off each album like I would with something more conventional, including early Bjork. That's part of what makes a concept album good to me. On, dream, on a Dream Theater concept album, like Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence, for example, I'm only going to listen to two or three of the songs off it that I like. Medulla, however, or the Sigur Rós album, or just about any K.O. Dot, I'll feel bad in a way if I just pick off one or two songs. It's just so good to sit down and listen to the whole thing that I feel like if I pick a track, pick off a track, I can only justify it as a means of reeling in a new listener with a beautiful piece of something great. Taking one off and putting it on a playlist kind of ruins it, but that happens more often when an album isn't that strong as a whole. Uh, I may be veering off in a more general critique of albums, but that really sums up what I look for in a good concept album. Uh, thanks for the sweet, 
thanks for the sweet podcast, Mark. Um, you know, and, and I think Mark makes a good point there. Um, you know, uh, he actually he touches on something that I noticed too, because uh, I'm as guilty as the next person of, um, you know, creating mixes, creating playlists um, where I just kind of cherry pick certain good songs from albums I like and uh, put them on a big thing, put them on shuffle and just kind of cycle through and hope for the best. And, um, but I, he, I think he speaks to something which is that, you know, the, the, the idea of an album is kind of a lost art, even if it's not a concept album where the story is, is central to how the songs are arranged. The idea of having an album exist in and of itself is kind of something that people don't really focus in on. Um, you know, people are, are are much more into, I mean, especially with the pop music world, you know, uh, there's like three or four hit singles on an album, then you have your filler, yada, 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 you know, uh, you know, the deep cuts, um, y- you know, um, and, and, and I think that the idea of creating an album as a statement is something that is lost a lot these days. And from the albums I was involved in, Sorry, it was in the albums I was involved in with KO Dot. That was something we very much paid attention to, um, even with Maudlin of the Well. And I'm sure with the KO Dot albums that I wasn't involved in, um, that you know, it's it's this kind of idea where you're you're taking your best tunes and putting them and trying to create a musical statement. Um, and you know, it, it's kind of the thing where you know when I listen to the KO Dot albums now, uh, even as just a fan of the most recent ones. Um, yeah, I'm the same way. I can't just cherry pick and put, you know, individual ones in a playlist. Um, I, I like listening to the whole thing and I like when bands do that now, um, and try to create a, an engaging album from start to finish. And it's very rare that that happens. Um, and it, you know, it's something that I approach with Ballaset too. I mean, um, you know, I was very conscious of when I was writing um, A Time For Us, our first album, you know, uh, obviously you may disagree with me. You may think that there's maybe one or two good songs or no good songs, uh, and maybe there's some filler on there. But um, my entire intention, the entire time I put that thing together, was creating something that you start and you listen to from, you know, start to finish. Um, whether I succeeded or failed... Um, you know, that's not really up to me to decide that's, you know, it's subjective. You know, you may agree with me, you may disagree with me, but it's something I, I definitely try for every time I'm creating something original. And, uh, as that was my first real album, um, you know, it was my first attempt and, you know, I'd like to think that I'm getting better at it. Um, especially with the, the new Ballaset album that we're working on, um, which is a concept album, you know, really trying to create something that flows from start to finish where you actually like all the songs. Um, it's hard. And, um, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's something that I think is lost a lot of the times. And, uh, you know, you go back and look at some of like the prog rock records from the the seventies where, um, you know, the time, you know, the, the, the albums are about 40 minutes in length because that was the maximum you could put on a record. And um, and those are usually the best ones, because um, you're really you, you're imposing this limit on yourself to create an, um, a statement. And I think it's something that gets lost a little bit in the modern age with where there's really not a limit. Like, you know, you could make an album that has like 50 songs and is like three hours long if you wanted to. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't really matter if you put it as a, uh, you know, if you released it in a physical form, you could just put out the digital downloads of it. You could even make one long song uh, if you want to. And, um, and and I think people kind of don't really get the sense of editing. Um, and there are exceptions to it. Uh, Hubardo is a very good example. I think that's a, an amazing album that Kaoda did. Uh, it's a longer album, but I think, I think it works. Um, but there are other bands where it's just the albums just go on too long and they just try to pack too much stuff in. And as a result, you get a very unfocused piece of work when 
an album as itself is supposed to be a singular statement. Um, so yeah, see, and that that was uh, those are some great points, Mark, and um, uh, that's what you can expect when you respond to a topic of the week. That I will go through them, I will read them, and comment on them if I agree, if I disagree doesn't really matter um the point is i want your opinion heard and so stay tuned for next week when i will put out another topic of the week hopefully monday or tuesday um all right but now on to the interview um this is josh strawn and we're going to start with a track off the most recent uh, vora album called the missing and this song is called mare of the snake Hey, Josh, it's Greg. Hey, man, how's it going? Not bad. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, thanks for thanks for doing the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, man, of course. It'll be fun. <laughs> uh, so, uh, first question, uh, how how's it living in New Orleans? Um, it's interesting. It's really, I mean, it's, I've only, I haven't even been here a year, so I'm um, still adjusting. It definitely is a town that has a lot of, a lot of perks and some <laughs> downsides. So, you know, came down here like bright-eyed idealist and, uh, 
have been a little dashed by some of the downsides, but uh, it's been pretty good overall. I like the weather. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I bet uh, seeing the blizzards that hit last week, I'm sure you're a lot happier <laughs> where you are. Yeah, I made a joke though that that like you um, when you step outside and it's like 75 degrees in late January, kind of has this effect of like reminding you that August is coming. <laughs> <laughs> because down here you just don't you don't really leave the house. Um, the daytime in August, unless you're in an air conditioned car. <laughs> but, wow. No, it's cool. It's cool. I mean, it's a cool place. It's like it's a whole different universe from from living in New York for ten years. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, so being kind of removed from you know the 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 different kind of collaborator collaborators you were working with, um, have you still managed to you know get you know, music stuff done while you're down there for your different projects, or did you start any new projects? <laughs> um, I didn't. I haven't actually started anything that I didn't have going before I left. Okay. Um, the one thing that I've been spending more time on lately, um, Andrew Hawk and I worked on worked out like two songs before I before I moved, um, and we've just been we've been spending a little more time fleshing those out and getting those demos ready to kind of send around. But other than that, we've, we've shot back some back and forth, some Vara demos and, um, you know, I'm, I'm still working on stuff with Zora for as our swan. So everything's, I'm still working on stuff, but it's nothing, nothing completely, uh, no, no totally new projects yet. Okay. Uh, yeah. Cause for a while there, it seemed like you had a new record coming out, like, with you know, or, or it seemed pretty quickly <laughs> that you're having stuff coming out. So <laughs> yeah, busy no, I mean, the, 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 funny, the funny thing is how many things I've actually finished um, that that have been held up and not come out for one reason or another. Oh really? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it was just for a while there. Um, it was just working a lot. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, so I think there's actually a project that I did. Um, I'm trying to think of when I even recorded it. I, I think I got the I think I got the mixes back almost two two mate like two years ago. May Day. Mm-hmm. I remember it was May first because I just had a big party at my house on Valpurgis night. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, no, but it was. Just a bunch of label stuff getting messed up and had to find a new label. And now I've been waiting on artwork to get finished because they decided the, the new label decided they wanted to do a uh, seven inch instead of a cassette. So um, there's still stuff on the way. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and uh, yeah, I was, I was, I was listening, just kind of refreshing myself more i was listening to both the as our swan records today and they're both amazing first of all oh thank you um i was i was kind of curious how uh how that kind of came about because because you guys were you and zora were in the band religious to damn and then what kind of prompted the the name switch and and was it uh, kind of a stylistic shift as well yeah, I mean, it was a little of both. I mean, I've I've known Zora since I since I moved to New York. Uh, we were actually dating for a long time before we actually started making music together. And um, obviously, we're not not together anymore. <laughs> we haven't been for a long time, but uh, we've continued making music together. Um, basically, we worked on a track um, that ended up on the first record um, called "Lovely Day," mm-hmm. and we just we're really excited about the direction it was going in and I worked I, I called up my friend um, Sean from Letter S to help us out a little bit with some synth production and and um, so we just kind of ended up making this anomalous sort of like synth song and we were really happy with the way it came out and we've been frustrated for a long time with um, making religious to damn work as a live band um, which is just a rotating lineup and, you know, 
um, Jesse Krakow from Time of Orchids mm -hmm. uh, recorded the first record with us, recorded the record with us, you know, about, I guess, about seven of the songs or something. I can't remember how many. And Jesse's an uh, amazing player. Um, it was hard to find people who could who could pick up and play his stuff um, live. And, you know, we, we were doing, like, live strings, live harmonium, and all this stuff in, in little New York clubs, and it just was so hard to get it, to get it consistent and sounding right. So once we kind of had the electronic kind of bug, you know, mm -hmm. and we made this song that we really enjoyed, I was like... I was like, why don't we just do this? Why don't we just like go all out, you know? Yeah. And it, it, the sound was like so different, you know, mm -hmm. that we just we we decided not to keep the 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 same name. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. And um and and um and so uh, yeah, you mentioned the electronics thing. I mean, that probably made it a lot easier for kind of working at home as opposed to booking studio time, right? Because yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, it's like, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it, it's not like, um, a lot of our stuff isn't real, isn't really, I mean, it is, it is electronic sounding, but we're almost always using like tuned percussion and, oh yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. you know, sounds like that. So it's like, it's like in a way it's almost just like helped us like fully realize the kind of like music or like more orchestrated music we always wanted to do. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a different, we, Zora and I generally sit down, she'll, she'll write all the demos, um, with the exception, like there's one or two songs where I've kind of done the initial idea. Um, but for the most part, it's all her demos and then we'll sit down together for anywhere between a week and two weeks in a, you know, just diligently every single day working on the songs. And then after we do that initial thing, we can just shoot files back and forth through email. And that's one of the reasons it was easy for, not easy, but like moving down here, um, we can still make music together. You know, we yeah, just have yeah. to make, we have to, we have to make a week to, to, to sit together and make a new record, but that's not, that's not that hard to do. So <laughs> that's yeah, a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For her, for me to go to one e to, to each other's city. So Yeah, yeah, totally. That's yeah. cool. And um so I mean so right now, I mean are because it seemed like the second album came out pretty quickly after the first one. I mean it, I mean, do you have like a big backlog of material that you guys are working on? Yeah, I mean <clears throat> we actually almost even had <laughs> had the ridiculous idea of releasing a double album as our first record. <laughs> um, we, uh, we do write a lot pretty fast. Um, not, well, not fast, but just a lot. It's sort of very intense. Right. Right. Starts right. Writing, writing a record yeah. and almost to the point where I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the guy who's like, we have enough songs. They're all good songs. You can stop, you know, like, <laughs> like no, I got a new one. I got a new one. Like this one's going to be amazing. And I'm, they, they, you know, they end up being amazing. But it's, um, yeah, there's there's definitely, like, a lot of output. Oh, cool. <laughs> as, far as, cool. as far as the songwriting process goes. Oh, cool. And um, so uh, kind of switching gears a little bit, but uh, getting back to, like, Vora. Well, actually, even before that, because um, uh, I wasn't really aware of... Um, you know, how many bands you'd been in. <laughs> um, so, like, I mean, it, have you been in bands ever since you've been, well, even before you moved to New York City, but um, was kind of Blacklist the first kind of, like, because it seems like you guys were doing a lot of stuff with that band beforehand, right? Yeah, I mean, that was my first, that was the first band I was in when I moved to New York. Okay. And uh, it was funny, I didn't move to New York to do music. I had moved to New York to do like academics and psychoanalysis and all this stuff. I mean, I've been making music all my life, but kind of a, a series of events, <laughs> um, kind of unexpected things happened. Basically I ran into people who were into music I had grown up with and like loved all my life and sort of like they had the same perspective on it that I did. That mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily a popular perspective at the time, but it was kind of, that music was kind of becoming more and more ex, like not acceptable, but 
you know, you didn't, you didn't just meet a bunch of guys and who are into Sisters of Mercy and Fields of Nephilim and Wire and, and, and start a band and expect that you would, you know, maybe get some, uh, attention or success, but the landscape was kind of changing, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, um, I stumbled across a bootleg of, um, the first three comps at angels records in other music. Um, and those were records that I had been looking for for years and years and years. And it was just like this, I had been listening before, before I bought that, I had been listening to almost nothing but like Baroque pop, like Scott Walker, um, divine comedy, uh, Burt Bacharach, you know, Mm -hmm. Michelle Legrand, stuff like that. Um, and so it like, threw me back into that music in a huge way. Um, and then I had these, you know, these people who were into a lot of the same stuff and, uh, and it just kind of, that's how it happened. I oh, just cool. fell, out, fell back in love with like being in bands and making that kind of music. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry if I jump around a lot. I don't have a very good, uh, I don't have any notes <laughs> before I start talking. <laughs> I'm just I like mean, I'm just, just, you know, <laughs> sipping some Jim Beam, having fun talking to you. So. All right. All right, cool. Um, as you can tell, I'm a very, very professional at this job. Um, <laughs> which is why I don't get paid. Um, but <laughs> so it, yeah, because I was kind of curious how because uh, I think I talked to Kevin about this in in the interview I did with him, but. Um, but but how did you make the jump from because there there is kind of to me at least you know getting kind of discovering you first through Vora uh, well actually discovering you first just through hanging out with you at Toby's house but uh, <laughs> right and, right <laughs> and just you know having fun and talking but um but from the Vora stuff to or from the Blacklist stuff to the Vora stuff I mean it sound it felt to me like kind of a a natural kind of organic progression stylistically. Um, was it just you wanted to do kind of a harder edged version of what you were doing previously? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, it was, I mean, there were a lot of reasons that Blacklist fell through the way mm-hmm. that it did, but I mean, I, I kind of just, we had always been in, like in Blacklist, we'd always kind of, I, I always felt like one of the things that, that made us different from a lot of bands that were into like dark post punk was we were also all big, like fans of like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and like Rat and Motley Crue. And, you know, Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's always this kind of like heavy element and the kind of metal element to what we did. And, um, we always kind of like flirted with that end of things. And, I kind of actually started getting, I, I, w- I was never like into like black metal or anything like that. Like, you know, in the nineties that was, I was totally in my goth industrial, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Brit pop, all that stuff kind of universe. So like, you know, I, I, it was like discovering things like hearing the, for the blue house Nord, um, the more of a record, um, Two, this is the two, the dialogue with stars, and mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I just started listening to Neurosis, like Eye of the Storm, Eye of Every Storm, or whatever, and um, you know, I was just like really kind of like feeling that kind of intensity, and those guys didn't weren't on the same page, so um, had you know, just ended up that was right around the time I met Kevin, so uh, just floated him the demos that the bandmates in Blacklist didn't like, and he liked them, so that's how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, the, the two, again, um, the two Vora records, I mean, were, uh, I mean, I love them immensely. Um, not even just because, not, e- not even just because I know the people involved, but I mean, like, it's just like, I don't know, it's kind of like the right. music music I want to hear. <laughs> you right, know, right. You know, I'm, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, but, um, but I was kind of curious, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of what, what went into, well, actually, let me backtrack again. Um, because I have a hard time, uh, figuring out the lyrics 
on those albums. <laughs> right. That I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if that was on purpose. <laughs> that that yeah. I can't I can't find the lyrics anywhere. <laughs> Very much, very much intentional. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, because I think I asked you once over uh, instant message if I could get the lyrics or something, and then I didn't get a response. I'm like, okay, I think that's probably a sign that. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, well, we um, we put I printed the lyrics for um, the new record in the vinyl, um, but but that was the first time they, any of the lyrics for the band had ever been printed anywhere um, okay. because there was. There was initially like a, a very conscious um, decision to make to make that ambiguous oh, and, that's cool. and not make that not easy to figure out. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. And um, <laughs> well, because I was gonna, uh, I was going to ask like lyrically, um, just because you know following you on Facebook and you know your you know your your very you know in depth posts about a variety of different subjects. Um, and and you even mentioned you know you went to New York to study and everything like that and I was just wondering how much of that fa- factors into your lyrics like you know um, it, you know I mean you're very much you know uh, in the know as it were uh, on like world events probably more than I am <laughs> but um, I was just wondering you know what how that kind of factors into the worldview you try to present um, in your lyrics. I've kind of been going through this interesting. Uh, like you were talking about, like all of the material that I've been working on over the last couple of years, and kind of been going through these weird uh, dilemmas as to how to treat different material, and and I, what it what it, I'm realizing that it does kind of come down to is like different bands have different, um, you know, different kind of like like uh, approaches to things, <clears throat> and um, for I mean, Blacklist was always very kind of like didactic and manifesto-ish and like, you know, fist in the air. It was like, you know, that those were like my efforts to kind of write political anthems. Like, like they were kind of like the clash, but also not as sort of like explicit, you know, we're singing about class war and Sandinistas and all that. You know, I kind of wanted to make a record that, that was about those things, but that, um, <clears throat> They kind of like read differently, I guess, you know, in a lot of the ways those lyrics function are to sort of, uh, create multiple layers, you know, uh, mm-hmm. of meaning. So, you know, it, it might appear to be kind of somebody speaking to a lover or something like that about, you know, the past and nostalgia. So it reads and it sounds that way, but it also has a lot of, of deliberate, references to like political ideas like nationalism and you know the romance for the for the for the unified past and all this kind of stuff and um not that i'm a nationalist i'm very much not right (laughs) um so uh but so i mean it could that 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 band it came through the most but that's actually why the vara stuff was intentionally so veiled because the first Vara record was my sort of uh, deliberate uh, step away from that kind of explicit sort of like, you know, I am going to talk about this thing yeah. um, <laughs> kind of stuff. And it was kind of like making an effort to be more more poetic and more imaginative and more uh, ambiguous. Um, I was inspired by ideas still. I was really interested in like... Uh, I, the phenomenon has a name. I can't remember now what it is, but you've seen these these posts of like, uh, you know, abandoned places around the world, abandoned mm-hmm. cities, and you know. And so I was always really fascinated by that. First, because it was fascinating. Second, I was fascinated with why it was fascinating. And third, I was fascinated with the idea that the moment those things were posted as secrets, they were no longer secrets. So. Um, the first of our record was kind of about this imagination of a secret island, you know, but that, you know, the, the, the politics kind of stops there um, with that okay. record. So, um, and then the, the second one was just really super personal. I was just like, I'm going to stop, stop talking about the world entirely or be being inspired by 
outer things entirely and just do a record about inner life kind of stuff. That's, that's all like super personal experience stuff for me, that record. I think I remember reading something you said where there's there is kind of a you know um, you know kind of a uh, an optimism to those records. Would you would you say that's correct? Did I read that right? <laughs> the Laura records? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, I'd say maybe more humanism than than optimism. Okay. The, re- the first record definitely it doesn't even really have to do with uh, optimism or not optimism. Um, the second record is probably more like go to kind of goes through these like ups and downs of of the shit we go through in in life, you know, mm-hmm. love and things like that, and lands on a, lands on a sort of bleak yet optimistic kind of. Uh, note. Although we did have we did have a song that there were there there were a couple different ways to resolve that song cycle, and what, we have a song that we haven't released yet that's like super like uplifting and optimistic. Um, but that didn't really end up being being the vibe. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like I like the way it ended up better. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, well, one thing I mean about the uh, the Vore records that I really like too is just um, 
I mean, there you have these kind of, you know, hooks in it that aren't like, you know, I'm not, and I don't mean to say that like in a poppy kind of way, you know, not like a, you know, a, like a device or something like that. But there's just like these really beautiful, memorable vocal lines and melodies over the top of the music, which I think just helps. Um, I don't know. It just, it's, I find it very moving myself. Um, yeah, I have a really hard time relating to music that doesn't have those. Oh, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> but me, me too, not sometimes. Necessarily, <laughs> not necessarily relating to music that doesn't have them, but I mean, it's just, it's such a huge aspect of what attracts me to almost any kind of music, even though I do like a lot of, like, less melodic, like, less um, traditionally hooky stuff, noise stuff, and things like that. Like, but that's still, it's still just, it's, so deeply ingrained in everything that I sort of consume um, mm-hmm. as a, as a listener that it just naturally comes out as you know. Also, you know, it's actually it's it's, an, it's a huge effort for me to like make something that is a melodic. Yeah, <laughs> which sounds sounds like a brag, but it's actually not. If you have a if you have a passion and appreciation for like like super heavy, weird, non-melodic stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I actually almost view it as, as, as much a handicap as a, as a strength of mine as a writer. It's like, I wish there are times that I wish I didn't always just have this, this, uh, <laughs> uh, this, I don't know what, what, what you would call it. Like a, a natural gravitation towards the hook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, no, it, it's funny. I mean, it's taken me a long time to kind of come to grips with that because I, I feel the same way, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, uh, you know, I, I think I remember having conversations. I've mentioned this before. Having conversations with people at a KO dot show when I was in the band, and they're like, "Oh, so what? You know, crazy, arty, you know, math or math rock or or crazy abstract avant garde shit are you into?" And I'm just like, "Oh, uh." I'm into Iron Maiden, um, <laughs> right. you know what I mean, and yeah. and and you know, and I always felt kind of weird and out of place because you know I was never really the, I'm, and still to this day, like you know I have an appreciation for a lot of different stuff, but you know I mean, mm-hmm. you know the melodic stuff is usually what gets me more, I guess emotionally invested in a, in a band or or a piece yeah. of music, you know. Um, you know, so it, yeah, so I can relate totally to that experience where it's just like I can't not write. You know, I, I've always wanted to be like, oh, let me write a song that just has no choruses, just just verses, and and I, I can't do it. <laughs> I've been trying. No, for sure. I mean, I, I, I definitely, I almost feel like it puts me at the, this like weird. Um, I feel like the kind of uh, trends and and sort of. Uh, thinking in like music journalism and, and subsequently music consumption and thinking about music is like, uh, almost away from that to a degree. Mm-hmm. It's not like people don't care about melodies anymore, but like there are records that I listen to sometimes where I'm just like, when I look at what gets, uh, praised and what doesn't like, for instance, like, um, you know, James Kelly from Ultra Plagues has his new project now, mm-hmm. Wife, um, which is just a straight, like, it's, you know, it, nothing resembling, like, the black metal stuff of Ultra Plagues. It's just, like, electronic music with, like, poppy hooks and stuff. And that, that stuff seems to, when, you, when, when I've read some of the reviews that, that definitely aren't here and what I'm hearing, you know, it almost seems like they're weirdly put off by by the kind of, communicativeness and the, the, the melodies and stuff. I'm just like, this is ingenious. Like, why wasn't this on every list last year? Yeah. Why is, why is this like thing that you feel is so arty on all the lists? I'm, I'm not really sure that it is as arty as you think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I tend to stay away from music journalism. Um, uh, in so much as, I mean, except for the fact of sending them copies of my music to try to get, uh, some sort of response, but (laughs) (laughs) yeah, Yeah, I mean, it's it's a whole can of worms in itself. I I mean, that's, but I I sometimes I have, it's like, I have music uh, journalist friends on my Facebook and like I had this whole kind of like, uh, identity crisis, I guess, during the blacklist years, because I was also, like, writing, like, and I was kind of 
kind of had one foot in the like music world and one foot in, foot in the journalism world. And like journalism is kind of like a passion of mine. It's like, you know, something I really love and like, a, like the days of like great journalists, you know, I kind of, if there's any profession I romanticize, like, I, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily be a politician. I would want to be a journalist. But, right. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not that I have it out for music journalists. It's that I have it out for the state of journalism generally, you know? And mm-hmm. I think that across, across the, the board, you know, it's like, it's hard to find a good political journalist. It's hard to find a good music journalist. They do exist. There are people who write, you know, awesome stuff for, for the quietest and for pitchfork and for, you know, Politico and the Atlantic, every, but it's, it's still it's sporadic, you know, it's like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, no, I, no, I agree completely. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, yeah, political journalism. I mean, yeah, I can't, um, it, it's just bringing up bad memories of Christmas and, um, and arguing with my family. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. I didn't mean to bring back traumatic, uh, no, no, no. traumatic memories. No, it's not traumatic. It's, warning. <laughs> it's not traumatic. It's more like, um. It's, but I know what you mean because it's kind of like you know I know the way I feel about certain things and you know but I also you know coming from having you know very 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 conservative in laws and, uh, and and everything like that it's like you know I can appreciate when someone comes to me with you know at least you know a well researched side of an argument and it makes and, you know it, you know it makes me you know very leery of of any kind oh, of, yeah. of of any kind of mainstream topic because or you know, news source because, you know, liberal or any or otherwise. And, uh, but it's kind of like, you know, but yeah, it's like, I, I'm, I've, I've always looked for, let me, find, you know, I would love to find the one, you know, like the journalist who, you know, <laughs> you know, like does their work really well. And, you know, so that I could point to something and, and you know, have, you know, but I'm not well researched enough to have these kind of arguments. So I just let, let, I just get yelled at for, you know, my president <laughs> ruining the world. And, <laughs> Right, right, and, right. You know, right. you know, and then let my dad call me his pinko son. You know, that's it's fine. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's it's funny. Like one of the things I'm wrestling with right now, you talking about like the fact that I write all the stuff on the internet. I'm, I'm wrestling with the fact that I need to stop doing it <laughs> because, for, I mean, for so many different reasons. But it's like it's you know, um, people people tell me like, oh, you sound so. You know, you sound so angry, or you sound so mean, or you're so much nicer when I meet you in real life, or or whatever. And um, you know, I I actually <clears throat> I'm obviously pretty vocally anti-religious, but I uh, I mean my my in-laws are are evangelical mis- missionaries, you know, who currently live in in uh, in Acadiana, Louisiana. So it's like. Uh, <laughs> um, people it's it's like it's like you can't you kind of can't win it's like um it's like if i bragged about the fact that you know i get along well with and sort of spend like all my like a lot of my holidays and some of my spare weekends and spare time with with these folks who are like politically like if we were if we were at a at a debate forum we would be trying to completely destroy each other in the debate Mm -hmm. but you know these are people i get along with like like and love to death, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. But, but what do you do on social media? Do you brag about that? And you just sound like an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh by, oh, by the way, everyone, <laughs> you, what you don't see is this, you know, but like, so, you know, you, you lose either way. Yeah. 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 No, I, yeah, I know it's, um, yeah. It, yeah. I think I'm, I'm at the point now where aside from posting updates, I'm trying to, to, to wean myself off Facebook for the time being because it's just there's just too much. I, I just get upset and angry way too easily and <laughs> Yeah. And there's more productive things I could be doing. <laughs> well, the, you know they don't get your clicks if you're not mad. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, I understand that. <laughs> yeah. Um so well uh going back to the Vora stuff though, uh so you said you've been trading demos back and forth um, about that. You know, what, what do you guys have any plans for recording anytime soon? Um, we don't have a we don't really have a calendar set out yet, but um, 
you know, we we hammered out some ideas back and forth over the summer. Um, well, we 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 actually had kind of like I had kind of like conceptualized this idea to them before I left um, of a sound that I kind of was you know feeling in a way we could kind of go about doing it for you know a, make make the best of 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 like the fact that it's just hard for bands to get resources to make records right now mm-hmm. um that 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 whole kind of like game plan sort of fell through and i guess um charlie and kevin then went into the studio and messed around with some ideas um one day and recorded them and sent them to me and um they were awesome um that's that's the thing about about being in a band like Bora, like like if you don't, <laughs> um, if everybody's what everybody plays and everybody's ideas are almost always awesome. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's like my my role as like the kind of like quote unquote creative director, or whatever the fuck I you would say it, I am in that band, um, is to be able to just be like, look, that's ingenious, but let's try it this way instead. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of, that's kind of how that happened. Like, like they sent me awesome songs, but I was like, this is kind of like more what I'm thinking. And I sent them like a couple of demos and then Toby was like, Oh, I have this thing I'm working on. It's kind of like that. He said, I was like, Holy shit, that's perfect. You know, that's awesome too. And you know, so now, so now we kind of have this, this, this little cluster of, of ideas that now sort of represents a, a sort of vibe. Um, and uh, Kevin just wrote me the other day that he's been uh, doing some really cool guitar manipulation stuff that sort of fits with the feel of of, of the idea for the record. So um, I I would I, I kind of in my in the back of my head this isn't an official plan but I, would, I mean I would like us to to record it next year mm-hmm. for sure. So like early next year I think would be kind of realistic. Um, that's my that's my hope. Okay. So, cool. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, and uh, c- can we expect more guitar solos? Because <laughs> I noticed Kevin snuck one in on the last one. Uh, no, actually. Um, well, that's kind of. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but I mean, my part of my part of my like when I was talking about that initial game plan was that uh, uh, we did the song. Um, the next to the last song on, on the last four hour record, I thought it was really interesting because it, Toby was playing like bass on, on the synth. Um, Charlie was programming the drums and, and playing them on the pads that I use to like the NPC type pads that I use for as our swan. And so people are, everybody, everybody's kind of like out of there. I mean, all those guys are, are super talented at anything that they do. Mm-hmm. Um, but these weren't necessarily like their, their, um, go-to instruments, you know? Um, so I, it, it was, I thought it would be interesting to kind of throw everybody out of their comfort zone in a sense and, um, kind of do more of that. But, uh, yeah, I don't think it's, it's not gonna, <laughs> it's not gonna sound very much like a metal or even a very, very much like a guitar record. I don't think, um, okay. even though there will be guitar, even though there will be guitars on it, mm-hmm. um, that's about the best I could say right now. All right, kind of. that's well. It was more just me joking around too, because I remember uh, talking with Kevin at a Disrhythmia show, and he was explaining how he kind of snuck it, like when you guys were out of the studio, <laughs> and he said, "Oh, let me put the solo on there." Oh man, it was, when he said that, through, I was like, I was so psyched. It's, it's kind of one of the things. I mean, it's one of the things I love about about Var and one of the ways I've always explained, like people trying, like talk about our sound and how we're a combination of this and that. And I was just like, we just do whatever we want, like at any moment, you know, it's like, it's like, that's the only time that he just like shreds out a solo on the whole record. And I love that it just stands there. Like, Oh, here, here's, here's this like George Lynch shit, you know, like yeah, yeah. all of a sudden on this one song. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, total freedom for sure. It's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, uh, oh yeah, interestingly enough, um, I, I'm trying to. Uh, it, it hasn't happened yet, but I've been on and off in contact with uh, Neil Kernan, the producer, 
and like uh, trying to see if I can get him on the podcast so I can ask him all my questions about Rage for Order. <laughs> oh wow! That that's my goal. Like you know, I, I told him I said I'm probably just going to pick your brain about Rage for Order, and uh, and then I didn't know he was in. I just found out recently he was involved with the Dokken Records. I'm like, okay, I've got a billion questions for you now about <laughs> records that are like 30 years old. <laughs> that is unbelievable. <laughs> I, very important record. Very important record for the boys in Vora. I know, I know. That's why I, don't, I... <laughs> I don't think we would be a band had that record maybe not existed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, my first question, I mean, I asked him over an email. I said, how did you get the guitar tone uh, on Rage Forder? Because I said, that's one of the most awesome guitar tones I've ever heard in my life. And apparently it's uh, Marshalls that are halfway dead or that are on the verge of dying. That's how they got that. Oh, guitar. man. <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> so basically unless you've got a Marshall that's about to kick the can you're never going to re- recreate that sound <laughs> that's great yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, well I can't wait for that podcast yeah I know well uh, yeah he's been uh, we haven't set anything up yet so it's more of just a pipe dream at this point <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah cool man um so, uh, so I was going to ask this too, like, um, in terms of like newer music, um, what's kind of been, uh, catching your ear lately? Cause you, uh, like, I, I, f- I feel like I find like a gazillion bands out through just like p- stuff you post. Um, so like what, what <laughs> <laughs> you um, seem to have your ear, music, ear to the ground more. <laughs> music listening for me has been weird since I've lived down here. Um, like, uh, radio in New Orleans is really interesting because, like, the hip-hop stations have, like, because uh, nothing really seems to, like, operate by the, like, the clear channel laws of, like, you know, the classic rock station has to play Stairway to Heaven a billion times, and, you know, the hip-hop station has to play Iggy Azalea seven billion times. There is a station that's like that, but, like, all these stations, like, like sometimes turning on like classic rock radio sounds literally like you're just turning on the radio in 1985 and you're yeah. just hearing all these songs. You're like, what is, what is you constantly like, what is this? What is this? So it's kind of like fascinating. And then there's tons of like great, like all the radio stations support all the local, like underground hip hop and bounce and stuff. And so you hear a lot of cool, like Southern hip hop, um, on the radio and, I drive more, so I've been like listening to old records. I've been pulling out my CD player, you know, you know, all my CDs. So mm-hmm. I'm the like the record I listened to the most this past summer was Simple Minds' New Gold Dream. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but no, like newer stuff. Um, like I said, I got really into that Wire record. I mean, the the Wife record. Mm-hmm. Um, What's between and. Um, <sighs> I was listening to some of the, you know, the recent um, Vatican Shadow record, and I mean, I mean, I've been honestly since I've been here, I've been working so much on my own music and getting out the the other Swan record that I've been listening to a lot of, a lot of mixes, a lot of master, you know, it's like yeah, yeah, <laughs> that and taking care of a uh, two year old. I don't, I don't, I haven't been listening to as much new stuff as usual. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry to sorry to disappoint. Oh I, no! I, it's actually, it's, I mean, it's weird for me. I mean, I listen. I've been listening to like a lot of uh, Steve Reich and, and you know, just really, really all over the place. It's hard hard to even really put a put a focus on on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that's cool. Um, well, uh, well, you brought up um, you know having a child. I mean. Um, has being a father uh, changed anything in your? Uh, are there any lyrics you've been working on about being a dad? <laughs> Actually, a... in a really in a really screwed up way, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I've had this. I mean, I've had this. I've had this thing that I've needed to write about, like ever since it happened. But like, um, yeah, like shortly after my daughter was born. Um, we in our apartment in Brooklyn. We had this this, this neighbor that was like, uh, 
um, cr- throwing these crazy fits next door. And they actually won, like, one of the very first times it ever happened, it actually almost sounded like there might have been somebody in the room with him. And it was so dark that it, we were like, is he, gonna, is he, like, hurting somebody? Is he going to, like, kill somebody? Like, is there a person in the room with him, you know? Mm-hmm. And this is, like, right after my daughter's been born. It's, like, 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 completely, like, most intensely beautiful, fragile, you know, like, sanctity of life type stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I've got this, this, you know, she's, like in her room asleep and this is happening next door. (laughs) Um, it was just like, it hit me in a way that I know it would not have, um, if it wasn't for my daughter (laughs) and the experience of having, you know, having had a child, um, violence, uh, towards people and especially towards children affects you and it, or it has affected me in a totally different way. So there was that stuff. And then, and then there was just kind of like the, the general trajectory of like uh, clickbait internet bullshit, you know, and, and like mm-hmm. just things kind of coming up. I was like, why is this in my, why don't, why did I just have to think about that just now? You know, yeah, um, yeah. everything from like, from like minor incidents, you know, people would be posting like, Oh my gosh, this guy's piece of garbage, you know, killing him or whatever. Um, to the whole like lost profits, scandal drama with that lead singer who was like into like child oh yeah you know molesting and all that stuff so like yeah it that all that stuff really kind of affected me pretty heavily in a way that i i i've been kind of like working out like the right musical outlet and kind of like how i would write about that or how i would kind of deal with those those issues (laughs) yeah Um, yeah. i haven't written i haven't written it yet but that's that's definitely in the works. Oh wow! Um, it's pretty, you know, it's it's hard. It's it's really hard to know how to deal with. Yeah, honestly, like in, in any kind of creative capacity, because the minute that you're dealing with those kinds of themes, you're in you're in shady territory to start with, you know. Yeah, yeah, so, totally. Um, you don't want to you don't want to do something coming from this totally like like kind of horrified at kind of standpoint and then be seen as like complicit or glorifying or what you know it's like it's all like how do you write the lyrics I don't, you know i'm not i'm not here to write a, a noise record right perspective of some rapist killer or something you know it's just it's actually i mean it's been an interesting thing to actually kind of think through from like all these kind of like philosophical standpoints, the art, like how could you actually communicate something like this um, and have it be aesthetically and morally, you know, yeah. sound across the board, you know? So yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's the main thing. <laughs> wow. That's, well, that's, that's <laughs> definitely an interesting take on it. Um, <laughs> That's cool. Um, and uh, so um, we'll, uh, well, one other thing I was going to ask um, um, is uh, like if you could name like one or two um, like um, moments on an, on an album. Uh, I mean, this is something this is because this kind of comes from an idea I've been kind of obsessing over lately where uh especially after listening to albums over and over again for like the last 20 years um you know i i find that there's like these little like silly moments in an album that like i obsess over <laughs> where i'm just kind of like i'm just kind of like i don't know why but like the way that you know such and such like hit this chord at this time or something like that like for some strange reason that sticks with me and that like somehow like gave me this new knowledge of something <laughs> right, uh, right, right you know um you know like holy fuck moments i guess would be the best way to describe them like you know had, <laughs> i was wondering if you had a had a couple that uh stick out in your mind <laughs> for... that's really interesting um i don't know i i i know exactly what you're talking about and i know that they exist but it would be like something i would have to like sit and think about I mean I um yeah I mean it's kind of there's just there's just songs that I mean throughout 
throughout my life I've always been uh, I don't know I mean pretty much like when the trumpets come in like the seventh seal by Scott Walker like uh, that never stops making me really excited and happy oh cool yeah um, <laughs> they're they're not nothing specific you know, I, don't, I don't know that it's really the, the, the specific moment that you're talking about but um it's an interesting one i wish i could have i wish i could have done my homework before oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a really cool it's a really cool question it's like um i love I mean, we, were, we were talking about like music writing it's like i love something i wish there was more of and probably probably my fault for not looking harder but um you know just like I like to listen to musicians talk about music. Um, like Nick Pod- Podgersky, when he writes, when he posts something about a record on his Facebook or whatever, mm-hmm. um, I'm always just like, man, that's so like, that just like listening to how somebody is listening is really awesome. You know? Yeah. And like, like when I was, uh, when I was sending the other Swan songs to remix and like, um, like Dominic, um, Inferno was talking to me about the songs. I was like, I was like, nobody has talked to me about this music in this way before, you know. And it's like really cool, you know. He's like referencing all the stuff I never, and like, like newer Madonna stuff I'd never checked out and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, it's just, it's awesome to like to hear people who are listening on that level, it's, you know. Uh, but uh, maybe when we post the podcast, I will have thought of the ultimate moment and I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll post it in my caption. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. No, that works. <laughs> and, uh, um, well, yeah, yeah. Just kind of like, um, you made me think, like, remember like one that I hadn't even thought about in a while until we were just talking about it was, uh, have you ever heard, um, well, you, you know the song Mother Russia by Iron Maiden of No Prayer for the Dying? I don't. Not off the top of my head. It's, um, to say, it, like, it's got this, like, it's probably the first song that made me obsess over, um, synth choir. You know, the, the, the famous, you know, the very oh, old yeah. <laughs> synth choir sound. And it's, um, you know, obviously the riff that they do in the middle of this song, it's really not a complicated riff. It's, you know, it's a very simple, like, uh, you know, minor scale thing, but what, mm-hmm. what what gets me about it is when they modulate it from E minor to C minor, and it's like mm-hmm. you know, I don't know why it's just like this, uh, just the way that the choir like modulates, like I was just like, holy shit, <laughs> and and so so forever that that that's like one of them. so it's like it doesn't even have to be any it's you know it's it's not even like like intellectual or you know. Uh, you know, like, oh, the, what a brave artistic choice. It's just like, I don't know, that's just fucking cool. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, um, no, you know what, actually? Um, this is only probably one among many, but um, this is one something that happened to, to me very recently, and uh, it's funny because I was, I was talking about this box set earlier and listening to old music um, because I had been pulling out my CDs, so I pulled that Compton Angels CD out again, and I was listening to it when I was driving to my in-laws' house um, <clears throat> for Christmas. Um, I was driving over the Chafalaya Basin, which is like this long, for people who've never been to New Orleans or surrounding areas, um, it's like this this long stretch here. It's like a, it's like driving basically driving over a really long bridge that's like so long you forget you're on a bridge. Mm-hmm. And you're you're surrounded by a swamp on all sides, so it's all these kind of like trees with moss, and you know it's like a really kind of like picturesque, gloomy landscape. And it was like fog, like completely fogged out in the morning. Um, and I put on the Concept Angels record, the second record, uh, "Sleep No More," which is probably one of the, my favorite albums of all time. And there's a song on that called "Dark Parade," mm-hmm. and there's a song. There's there's a moment where they start to detune the uh the strings in this like almost black sabbath kind of way it's just like stuff that, like something you never hear in music in, yeah. in like in like bands like that you know these kind of like post-punk a lot of dark post-punk bands you know mm-hmm. it's a heavy song but yeah every time every time that's like one of the that's definitely one of those moments that oh like, cool 
I love. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And um, actually, here, here's a this is not even a music related question, but uh, so a few years ago, uh, I actually went to New Orleans for a um a conference at my old job, and uh, I took a ghost tour. And the guy was mentioned. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was silly, of course. I mean, it was it was fun. Uh, started and ended at a bar, of course. But um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the guy was telling me, he, you know, he was saying like, oh, uh, uh, you know, something about oh, this guy bludgeoned the, his gay lover to death and and jumped out of the the window and whatever and went down and, and ran away and they never caught him. And he said, you might find that kind of weird, except for the fact that, you know, New Orleans has blood cults. So seeing somebody covered in blood is really not out of, out of the ordinary. And so just curious, <laughs> are there any blood cults in New Orleans? <laughs> Man, I, I mean, it, it's like it's like every day I run into something, like especially recently. And it's funny that you bring this up right now, because this past week there have been multiple times where... Um, I've been talking to somebody and just suddenly some weird, I mean, I mean, weird religious stuff is one thing, like, you know, people rising from the dead and, you know, it's all weird in the first place, but like, um, yes, I, I just had my daughter out, uh, at city park and this guy just playing flute, you know, like, I mean, there's tons of like really talented live musicians who play music everywhere in the town, which is really kind of cool, you know, like, oh, yeah, even yeah. though, like, even though jazz isn't necessarily my thing, especially not, like, traditional New Orleans jazz, it's never been my thing. I love to just hear, like, well-played live music all the time by people who are just doing it because it's just what the fuck they do, you know? Right, yeah. Um, so we're just, you know, it's really not all that uncommon of an experience and just have my daughter at this place, like, getting a hot dog in the park and there's a dude just like ripping on a flute of all things. And, uh, my daughter's dancing and he's having a good time playing flute for her and we're, like talking to him afterwards. And he starts going into all this like wild, you know, I mean, it's Christian stuff like officially, but I mean, everything down here is mixed with everything, you know? So, yeah. um, he starts, he started going into this whole theory of like, the, the pre-soul and his and this idea that, like, um, he was telling me this because something that he had sensed from my daughter, you know, that um, she must have heard it in her pre-life, which is the idea that, like, after conception, your soul leaves the body and wanders the world and then comes right back right before birth, and that's why you cry when you come out. It sounds like something, like it's, like it's almost like a joke, but, like, this guy, this was, was the guy's police. Um <laughs> And like you do run across this stuff all the time. <laughs> Blood cults, cult, I mean everything, you know, like new age. It's it's like if if it's a superstition, somebody down here is like totally into it. <laughs> um, That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, blood cults wouldn't surprise me. I've never, I haven't run into it personally, <laughs> but um, just just the sheer kind of volume of, of that kind of, uh, culture that's yeah. down here, uh, I would not be at all surprised. Would not be at all surprised if I stumbled across a, a blood, a blood cult person <laughs> next, next week. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then... it's interesting. I mean, I mean, it's like for somebody like me, who's like, like super kind of like ethically and politically anti superstition, but then aesthetically, attracted to all of that stuff, you know, like, yeah, yeah. um, it's, it's puts me in a kind of fun, interesting, uncomfortable place. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, I kind of just have to smile and nod and people are talking to me about, about these like wacky ideas. Yeah. <laughs> but, at the, but at the same time, I'm kind of like, wow, that's like more creative than anything I would hear <laughs> yeah, you know, in, in a in a uh, intellectual forum in New York or whatever, you know. Yeah, so, totally. And uh, give and take. <laughs> and my w one other kind of um, you know touristy question, I guess. Uh, have you have you witnessed a, a live jazz funeral at all since been down there? Oh, a second line. I have. I have. Like, oh, cool. Uh, happens all the time. Um, it's really cool. Um, 
yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it's just, it's another one of those things about this town that it's, it's like, it's the, the weird kind of combination of like joyfulness and morbidity that kind of like surround and, and but by the same token, this is like a completely like normal thing to, to see happen. Um, uh, so yeah, it's cool. It's, Oh wow! <laughs> more of that kind of like music permeated culture, you know. Just, yeah, you know, you see it, and it seems like there's a parade, but uh, somebody's dead. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's cool. Oh, cool, cool. Well, uh, <laughs> well, hey man, you know, thanks for taking that time to talk with me. This was really awesome. Um, you know, of course, man, I had a great time. Yeah, yeah. I, so. um, you know, obviously. Uh, huge fan of the, of the i mean you're a cool person in the first place but huge fan of the music so it was like really cool Thanks, um you know i look forward to hearing uh you know the, the andrew hawk thing and then the more azar swan and more bora <laughs> so <laughs> prolific all prolific everything yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah totally totally um well give me money <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah, it'll well, be even more. <laughs> yeah, or or play you enough times on Spotify where you actually make a cent. You know that would be nice. Yeah, right. <laughs> That'd be sweet. <laughs> um, but we're meantime... all entrepreneurs now. Yeah, that's, 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 that's my that's my that's my motto. That's the, the 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 music business is new uh, new dictates for us all. Yeah, you know, be I, more inter- be more enterprising. Yeah, it's artistful. I I agree with that. I mean, I, I feel like you know, I've said this before that it's just like I feel like someone comes up with this really cool idea and like is somehow successful with it, and then other people try it and are not successful with it. So I feel like you know your goal as a musician is to try to find that one way of presenting your music or doing something that will somehow set you enough apart that it'll draw enough attention to people to you for that brief time <laughs> because then yeah. like once that idea fails you can never go back to it you know i don't know right uh you know yeah I mean, that's man we could have a whole nother podcast about about uh the state of the music industry. about all that stuff man <laughs> yeah. it's so it's so dark and so bad <laughs> yeah and i don't care what any optimist or kind of people who are like, oh, it's always been, you know, this. And it has not always been like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> every every single person who actually is trying to do this, like, you know, like with any kind of, if you have if you have any remaining uh, vestige of belief in any any attempt to keep separate, like the the creative from the enterprising and the entrepreneurial, like, then you're just, you're fucked. You're, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're a joke. Um, you're, you know, the old, the old guard, you know, get with the program. It's like, okay, well, well, I guess enjoy your, enjoy your stupid <laughs> free records. They're all terrible. <laughs> well, I'm just waiting for the next person to try the, uh, the Wu Tang idea of making the one copy of the album for a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's like RZA, RZA, RZA stumbled across Walter Benjamin one day and his like light bulb went off. Like, oh shit! <laughs> this is the idea, this is the thing we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, man. Uh, you know, thanks for everything, and uh, yeah, like good luck and look yeah, forward. Yeah, thanks, thanks for asking me. I, I'm I'm honored to be included. So I, it was fun talking to you. All right, cool. We'll definitely have you on again next time uh, once the next record comes out for any any one of your projects. So, <laughs> cool, man. All right, cool. Have a good night. Okay. Thanks, you too. Thanks, right. mm-hmm. Thanks Bye. Bye.
Just like the blood